It's not often on our show that we have somebody on just to talk about, uh, you know, whatever we feel like talking about because they're cool. But in this particular instance, we're going to make an exception. Our guest tonight is Andrew Philip Smith, and we're going to talk about his new book, among many other things, coming up tonight on Talk Gnosis. Hi, everybody. Father Tony Sylvia and Jonathan Stewart is my co-host as per usual. Hello, Jonathan. Hello, Father Tony. How are you doing? I'm great. How are you? Good, good, good. So uh, I have been a fan of our next guest for a long time here. In fact, uh, his book, The Gnostics, well, which has a new title now, but we'll get to that, um, is probably the number one book I recommend to people uh, who are interested in Gnosticism more than anything else. And it is uh, Andrew Philip Smith joining us all the way from across the pond. Hello, Andrew. Thank you for joining us. Hello. Yes, uh, and thank you for uh, accommodating, um, you know, our schedule here. I know that time zones are a bit of a pain, so <laughs> we really appreciate you taking the time. So let's start right off and talk about uh, your, talk about the Cathars, your new book, The Lost Teachings of the Cathars, which you can pick up uh, Amazon and all the places where fine books are sold, um, is a, a bit of a departure from other books and uh, uh, scholars might uh, produce on the Cathars, which is mostly names and dates and places and things. Yours goes into a, uh, a lot more detail about what the Cathars actually did. Um, so let's talk about them. Uh, can you tell us who who were the Cathars and uh, you know what what happened to them and all that kind of good stuff? Yeah, sure. Um, well, the Cathars uh, were a, a form of Christianity that flourished in the medieval period in the south of France and the north of Italy, and we're talking about the 12th to 14th centuries. And they had, uh, they were dualists, they had uh, Gnostic features, and they um, became quite popular in an area known as the Languedoc in the south of France. So they, they were very much a contrast with the Catholic Church of the time because the uh, Catholic Church was very worldly, very materialistic, and you know it had all sorts of problems with uh, corrupt priests and the corrupt hierarchy and all the things that you know you think of when you think of uh, medieval Catholicism. Um, so the Cathars were simple people who had uh, quite strict conditions, at least for the uh, perfect kind of inner circle of the Cathars. Um, yeah, so the, um, the Catholic Church perceived the Cathars as being a problem, um, although the Cathars weren't at all interested in temporal power themselves. And um, uh, it's just that kind of by being there, they created such a contrast with the goings on of the Catholic Church. And also, you know, there are all sorts of political issues to do with the uh, uh, kingdoms at the time in um, Europe and, you know, all those kinds of things. So the uh, Cathars had an entire crusade declared against them, known as the Albigensian Crusade in the 13th century, uh, which was really a horrific and bloody affair, uh, even by the standards of medieval warfare. And um, so these crusaders, who were mostly from the northern kingdom of France, uh, made their way through the Languedoc, which was a pretty civilized and enlightened place, and uh, just devastated it. Um, and then after a whole generation of uh, crusading, um, the crusade was declared at an end. And then the Inquisition was invented to root out the remaining Cathars, and you know, where there's the Crusade was concerned with, you know, physical domination. The Inquisition was concerned with uh, spiritual and intellectual domination. Uh, so, you know, the Inquisition is uh, very infamous. Um, but that's where it started. And the, so the Cathars are, you know, as you were saying, they're well known for the things that happened to them rather than what they did themselves. And so, you know, uh, there are many books about them which are, you know, a list of atrocities and describing how the Crusaders went from uh, castle to castle and, you know, the uh, military operations and all that kind of stuff. Uh, but there's very little really about 
the teachings of the Cathars and their practices, you know, which is obviously those are what marked the Cathars out from the Catholic Church, and they were the kinds of things that were important to the Cathars. Mm -hmm. So uh, the you go in, into a lot of detail in your book about the what the Cathars actually believed and did, or what we know about that. Um, can you talk to us about their uh, their their rituals and their beliefs a little bit? Sure, and the um, the rituals and beliefs they interlock together actually, you know, as they usually do. Um, so they believe that the material world in which we live was uh, created by Satan and that there'd been a fall from heaven and uh, as a result of this you know, it was kind of a, in, in that way it's very medieval you know much of a part of medieval Christianity um, that there was kind of a rebellion against God and a third of the angels left heaven and the material world was created and the spirits or souls of these angels are trapped in material bodies um, so they had uh, a myth which they actually inherited from the Bogomils, who I'm sure we'll get on to a bit. Um, and they told and retold this myth. It was very much a living thing from them. It um, wasn't just a you know, static piece of scripture. And that's also kind of very Gnostic, this uh, mm -hmm. impulse to create you know, a theme and variations and to keep trying to work out you know, what applies to you uh, of the, in terms of the the myth and how it might be altered a bit and how it might be retold, all that kind of stuff. Um, so this was very much in the background of everything that they did, uh, the Cathar myth. And then the practices, the um, main practice was the consolamentum, uh, which was, uh, I mean, it's been described as an initiation ritual, uh, baptism, and um, you know, even a deathbed ritual all rolled into one. Um, so there were two categories of Cathars. The believers were the sort of secular people who had uh, very little restriction placed on them at all. But the only thing that they had to do was to give a greeting to the uh, perfect, who were the kind of inner circle of the Cathars. And that was called the melior, melioramentum. Uh, now, the perfect could only be initiated via the consolamentum by another perfect. So you get this chain of initiation. And once a perfect had been initiated through the consolamentum, he or she was bound to be celibate, uh, to be a vegetarian, or more strictly, a piscatarian. Uh, and there were very various other strictures placed on them. And the idea was if they kept to the uh, disciplines of being a perfect, and they were in, still in good standing as a perfect when they died, then the spirit which was trapped within them would be returned to the heavenly realm. Um, and also due, the consolamentum, um, the term is related to the Gospel of John, which was the um, favorite gospel, and in many ways the only gospels that the Cathars used, uh, in which Jesus promises that the paraclete, uh, who is the consoler, you know, in a Latin version of the uh, uh, Gospel of John, uh, will come to them after Jesus has gone. Um, so during the consolamentum, the uh, spirit was uh, understood to descend on the Cathar, and then the Cathar was a perfect who could initiate other Cathars to become perfect and had all these uh, strictures on them. That, that, yeah, one thing I found very interesting about that process was if a Cathar perfect um, was found to be, I guess, imperfect, uh, his whole lineage becomes invalid. And so you have uh, periods of, of time where uh, a perfecti would, um, you know, go off the wagon or whatever, and then uh, other uh, other Cathars would have to come in and, and reconsecrate, as it were, that line. I found that to be very interesting. Uh, yes, I like that term, falling off the wagon for uh, <laughs> <laughs> keeping your vows. Um, yes, well, that, I mean, that really um, sums up the kind of structure of the Cathars, actually. Um, 
you know, the, uh, there was so much personal responsibility because if you didn't keep your own vows, then you know ev you were failing everybody else that you'd initiated. And yeah. It could possibly be a you know a whole chain of people which would spread out quite quickly. You know, if you initiate five perfect and then each of those uh, initiates five perfect, you know, you have responsibility for a lot of people. And um, you know, somewhat related to that, there was a monthly confession as well, but the, it was only the perfect who had to make the confession, and they made it in front of the believers who were the lay people. So, uh, you know, it's very different to uh, Catholic confession, or even, indeed the confession in just about any other church that I can think of. Um, you know, it's a great twist on the, uh, mm -hmm. you know, the whole guilt and uh, social control of the, you know, the Catholic confession. Um, rather, it's the, you know, more or less the priests themselves who have to abide by their standards and mm -hmm. tell the believers what they've been up to. That must have been very appealing to common people in, in that period of Europe. I think so, yes. And it must have been massively different. Uh, mm -hmm. but Jonathan, you want to uh, add anything? You want any questions before we start to wrap up here? Um, I, I guess we'll get more into it in, in the podcast. But, uh, but Andrew, I'm just wondering uh, what your opinion is for, for, their, for the Cafars' origins. Is this something that kind of, uh, you mentioned the Bogomils. Do you trace uh, their beliefs all the way back to the ancient Gnostics, some of the same groups who created Dog Hamadi, or is this a, uh, a more independent flowering of uh, Gnostic beliefs that's sort of just coming out of people interacting with, with the Bible? What's, what's sort of your opinion on that, of, of where Cafarism might come from? Well, kind of the answer is that we don't know where it comes from. I think that's the straightforward answer. Um, but you can trace this slender thread of uh, historical influence. Um, is that the Cathars did have a relationship with the Bogomils, who were often the Balkans, um, who also had a you know consolamentum ritual. They had um, you know the equivalent of perfect and the um, secret supper actually contained the myth that the Cathars used that I'd very briefly described there, and that was a Bogomil scripture. Mm -hmm. So then, if you start from the other direction, you have the ancient Gnostics, the Sathians and Valentinians, uh, then you have Manichaeans who incorporated Gnostic elements in their very uh, widespread and persistent religion, and you also have uh, Gnostic groups surviving, you know, into the 6th, 7th century in dribs and drabs and perhaps further. Um, so then you have to make the link between the Manichaeans and the Bogomils, and it's been suggested that there was another Christian dualist group, the Paulicians, who were uh, kind of in around the area of modern-day Turkey and Armenia, that kind of area, who could have had contact with the Bogomils because some Paulicians got um, relocated in Bulgaria, which was a uh, you know, centre of uh, Bogomil activity. So you can actually make a case that there is this slender thread of Christian dualism stretching through the centuries. Um, you can also, people have speculated that uh, because Manichaeism, you know, the, the structure of Manichaeism could survive underground for long periods, just for example in isolated families, so there may have been a Manichaean cell that survived or made its way to the south of France, or you know, as you mentioned, um, these things can happen spontaneously, um, they're kind of, you know, even in the most uh, degenerate aspects of uh, Christianity, you can find some, some Gnostic elements, and there was a, a scholar, Yuan Kulian, who um, argued that just on logical grounds, uh, there are only so many ways of combining the kind of ideas and terms that you find in Christianity, and you're going to come into Gnosticism eventually. I mean, you can also argue that, uh, not from a scholarly point of view, but from a more you know, spiritual and experiential point of view, that uh, people will have Gnostic experiences, will have Gnosis, and um, you know, they have this reawakening uh, that will spread in combination with the kind of uh, ideas that are latent in Christianity. So, uh, I mean, it's really very much up for grabs. Um, I wouldn't rule any of all of, the, all, all of those out. <laughs> mm -hmm. Yeah, very possibly could be a little bit of all of it, right? <laughs> yes. 
All right, well, that's a great place to wrap up the video portion, and I think we'll go on uh, in the podcast to expand on that a little bit and also talk about some of your other projects that uh, you know, have been of great benefit to the Gnostic community at large, so um, stay tuned for that. Uh, in the meantime, uh, I'm just <laughs> I'm finding a little bit of audio issues on this episode, but we'll, <laughs> we'll get through it. We'll, we'll get through it a little at a time. Um, so can you tell us where people can find you and your work on the internet? Uh, yes. Um, the websites are www.andrewphillipsmith.com and it's all one word and there's two L's in Philip and you can also look up uh, Bardic Press uh, that's all one word now, bardicpress.com um, uh, I did have another website with a hyphen in it but uh, I lost that website and it got taken over by somebody else so, <laughs> so <laughs> don't go there um, and you can look me up on Facebook and also there's a website for the Gnostic journal uh, the-gnostic.com and a Facebook page for the Gnostic. Um, so check them, those out. All right, and there will be links for all of those in the, in the show notes for this video as well. So yeah. click on down below for that. All right, well, thank you very much again for taking the time to speak with us tonight, and, uh, and we hope to continue this interesting conversation in the podcast. For those of you who are listening along at home, we will see you next week. Good night. Bye. This has been a production of the Gnostic Wisdom Network. For more information about this and all of GWN's programming, please visit GnosticWisdom.net. The opinions expressed in this show do not necessarily reflect the opinions of GWN, the Apostolic Joannite Church, or any other organization. This has been released under a Creative Commons Attribution Share Alike 4.0 International License and is brought to you by the generous support of our patrons. To support our programs and become a patron, please visit patreon.com slash gnostic. That's p-a-t-r-e-o-n dot com slash g-n-o-s-t-i-c. This has been a production of the Gnostic Wisdom Network. For more information about this,